Hi everyone, my name's Ian and I'm a technical writer at Salto Systems. Today I'm going to be talking about glossaries and more specifically I want to talk about uh, terminology management at scale and how we implemented a machine readable single source uh, glossary uh, within our organization. As I'm sure most of you will be aware, Simple glossaries are relatively easy to set up for individual projects, documents, but they become a lot more difficult when you try to scale them, especially when you try to scale the management in terms of terms and definitions across multiple platforms, projects, and even organizations. So as our organization grew in size, uh, acquiring different companies and different software platforms, we saw that we were also using different terms to describe what were very similar features across the company's range of software applications. So a pressing requirement emerged to efficiently manage the terms and definitions that we were using. It was important for us to have a single source of truth for all of these terms and definitions. And that source of truth had to be created in such a way that it could be adapted to a variety of outputs and formats. So when we started out on this glossary terminology journey, we saw that there were a lot of uh, challenges um, in the way. One of these challenges is that uh, glossary management and terminology management is, is a very subjective thing. So the big question was always, as Humpty Dumpty says in this quote from Lewis Carroll through the looking grass, which is the term uh, that we want to be the master term or the, the main term um, when we have a lot of different terms effectively meaning, meaning the same things? How do we come to this consensus? In our case, we had uh, a lot of different terms, which were effectively meaning the same things uh, across our different software platforms. As you can see here, we make access control solutions. Um, and even for example, a simple term uh, such as a lock or uh, a door or an access point, we weren't being consistent with this term across our different platforms uh, and even in the case of uh, a, a term that i'm sure is used in in of course lots of different platforms a term like user uh, we were using things like uh, people uh, members or card holders so so we weren't consistent um, in with with our terms across uh, across all of our different platforms how do we solve this well one of the approaches that we took uh, was uh, something that we were going to look at in this video and that effectively was uh, using terms to mean exactly what they say let's have a quick look at this video so quick dry and wood stain it's a wood stain from ron Seal that's quick dry it protects your wood and is rainproof in about 30 minutes which means in about 30 minutes your wood is rainproof and protected so if you want your wood stain to dry quickly, use one seal, quick dry and wood stain. It does exactly what it says on the tin. So this was an approach that we adopted. Um, something, um, you know, a term that does exactly what it says on the tin. And this, some of you might be aware, those of you who have lived uh, in the UK or uh, in, in the 1990s may have seen this advertisement. Um, and it's effectively, Come part of uh, the, the the English language um, in, in in the UK. Uh, it's become a common idiomatic phrase, and basically it comes to mean that the name the name that you come up with or the term that you come up with is an accurate description of the quality. So this was a this was the approach that we what we were looking at. We were looking at terms and we wanted to really accurately describe what they meant. Um, so. After a bit of investigation, um, we started looking at uh, term bases. What, what, what exactly are term bases? Well, term bases effectively is, is a database 
consisting of concept oriented terminological entries and related information. Um, and as you can see here in this uh, definition, usually they're in multilingual, multilingual format. So uh, that's something we'll look at a little bit later on. But before going into more detail about the multilingual format, it was clear that we needed a term base. Um, so how do we go about creating this term base? Well, um, this is a quote from uh, a website uh, called Terminology for Large Organizations. Uh, and they had a very useful uh, document called the Terminology Starter Guide. And, you know, this was a great place for us to, to start out. And lo and behold, uh, as this key quote says, it's the technical writer who's at the forefront of terminology development in, in, in organizations. Um, and it's the technical writer that works together with the product manager. And well, if you're lucky, in our case, this wasn't the case, but the terminologist to identify new terminology as it emerges and as products are being developed. Um, and of course, uh, of key importance is coming to an agreement on terms and definitions for, for consistent use. So uh, this, was, this was kind of where we started out. We knew what we wanted to do, but how did we go about uh, implementing this? So we started off by setting up a cross-disciplinary cross working group. This involved uh, marketing teams, product management teams, uh, research and development teams, and of course, technical writers. We started off having regular meetings uh, where we discussed the terms that we were using uh, in our platforms. And basically we just took uh, a giant Google Sheet or Excel document and we put all of the terms and definitions that we were using into that sheet uh, for discussion. We also used um, a, a, a GitHub and this was something that we uh, took inspiration from open source projects. For example, uh, the HTTP working group. Um, and we saw that um, the discussion uh, of terms uh, was something that um, a lot of these open source projects managed using GitHub issues or GitHub discussions. And what was really interesting here was that um, each person who was part of the working group for implementing this term base uh, could bring to the table uh, their thoughts uh, and almost um, evidence about which terms they think, based on even market research, which terms they think we should be using in, in, in the software. Um, as a few references here that we took inspiration from, uh, the aforementioned terminology for large organizations, a really great book um, called In My Own Terms, Terminology for Beginners and Beyond, uh, and I personally took a lot of inspiration in the work of Cameron Shorter at the Good Dogs Projects, who um, has done a really interesting job uh, working on, on glossary, uh, glossary management. We also uh, took inspiration from the way some we saw glossaries being implemented um, in other places, for example, the, the Kubernetes documentation, and again, more on that more on that later. So in our case, uh, we were clear that we needed to implement a, a term base. And this term base, we wanted it to feed into glossaries into different places. Um, so what were all these different places? Well, in our case, we had a support portal, which was more or less um, user interface documentation for orientated at end users. We also had a developer portal, which contained API documentation. Um, we're working on currently a design system. This isn't in place right now, but this is something that we want to uh, be able to use. Uh, for We want to be able to have glossaries appear in as well. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want our glossaries to appear in our translation management systems because we want our translators to be able to understand the terms that we're using 
across our applications. Uh, we also wanted groceries to appear in our corporate site and even uh, in our actual applications of themselves as well. So lots of different places uh, for, for groceries to, that, that, that groceries can appear in. And so as we were looking at the um, glossary term base and uh, management, management of terms, we were clear on one thing. We wanted to implement this machine readable single source mega glossary. But how are we going to do it? Well, we were already using Hugo, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. Hugo is a, a framework uh, essentially for, for, building, for building websites, a, a static site generator. And Hugo has a feature which is really, really useful, and it's called Hugo Modules. And essentially what Hugo Modules are, are different elements uh, that can be used uh, to in the creation of um, uh, of Hugo websites. Uh, in our case, uh, we wanted to separate out um, our our terminology repository uh, into uh, an individual Hugo module, and then we could use that Hugo module as a dependency for our other projects. The next slide um, is just a, a very brief. Uh, overview of this implementation. As you can see, we created a terminology repository in GitHub, um, and this was a Hugo module. The terminology itself, uh, we decided upon using YAML format, more about that later. And then we were able to uh, extract this uh, YAML format into all these different uh, outputs. So as I said before, uh, the support portal, for example, which is an HTML project, it's a website, uh, a developer portal as well, a translation management tool. In our case, we used, um, or we are using the translation management system called uh, Crowdin. And Crowdin is great because it has uh, an API that we'll be able to connect with. And so we're able to send out uh, our uh, glossary to crowd in, and so the translators can pick it up there. And what's great about that is that we're not having to manage a separate glossary within crowd in itself. More about that later. Um, and also, uh, the ability to use Hugo modules meant that we could effectively inject uh, our glossaries into, into different projects. Um, and again, this is still a work in progress, uh, but, but something that we're working on. Um, Across all of our uh, across all of our uh, entities. So, what did the YAML document look like? Well, um, we decided to come up with lots of uh, different parameters within the uh, within the YAML document. For example, um, we had a short definition. A short definition um, is uh, just a really kind of quick glance definition of a term. Uh, and this, for example, may appear in, in tooltips. As we're aware, um, a lot of people don't read uh, through uh, a, a large glossary. Um, and they really just want to know um, the meaning of a term as and when they're reading a specific set of documentation. But we also kept a, a long definition for the term because we thought this was useful, uh, again, for translators who maybe need a bit more context about what a term means. Um, and you know, in the actual glossaries themselves, as we'll see a little bit later, we also thought it was useful uh, to have synonyms, particularly um, in our case, because we were coming out of um, a, a system where we had different terms uh, that were being used in different platforms. Uh, and so the cinnamon, synonym uh, would make it easier, particularly for users uh, of our uh, software, um, you know, previous users of our software um, who were familiar perhaps with a different term. Um, and ultimately, uh, one of the useful uh, parameters that we had was a tag. Uh, 
So what we could do with these tags was that um, if we had a software platform that used a set of specific terms, we could say, hey, tag this, uh, tag this with just that specific platform and the term will only appear in the glossary for that specific for the documentation on that specific platform again we'll look at that um, a little bit later and as i say this is just an example um, but this is something that we really uh, were keen on, on on implementing so let's move on to standardizing um, and automating uh, glossary processes Something that was really key in this um, workflow was uh, using docs as code uh, processes. Uh, so in our case, we used Git with GitHub. Um, and this was useful not just for uh, um, version control, but also for, um, for being able to automate these processes. We were very uh, keen on making this a tool that was that could be used by uh, lots of different stakeholders. So we uh, wrote a, a detailed contributing guide to the project as well. Um, and this sat as a readme in the GitHub repo for the terminology project itself. And um, as you can see, one of the uh, key things with the aforementioned Hugo modules was being able to uh, take uh, a Hugo module and inject it into uh, the different projects. And how do we do that? Well, uh, by what's called in, in, in Hugo speak, vendoring and bumping the module itself. Um, so effectively, what this meant was that um, any user could come into the GitHub uh, repo they could make a pull request with a new term and a definition, or even just tagging a new product where this same term is going to be used. Uh, once these, um, uh, once this new uh, term um, has been approved, the uh, glossary is then uh, merged into the main branch in GitHub, and then um, the specific uh, writer or stakeholder would go to the um, Hugo repository where they want that term to appear uh, and then use this command, which is a Hugo mod get command. And by doing that, they were able to bring over the term from the, from the YAML. So uh, let's have a little bit a look at how um, this appeared. Um, one of the things that was really interesting was that we wanted to provide automated checks uh, in this standardization and optimization of, of, of our glossary processes. Here, for example, this was just a check in, in GitHub uh, with a little bit of a script um, the check that the glossary's alphabetical order was 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 correct. So no more manual checking, um, uh, which can be a little bit fastidious. Um, and one of the other key parts of this automization process was that we were able to mount the Hugo modules in the different projects. And what I, what do I mean by that? Well what we were able to do was to take the glossary YAML file and with that tagging that we saw before, uh, we were able to separate out the different terms and definitions into the different projects by tagging them with their, uh, with their product name. Um, and so that meant that each piece of uh, markdown was able to display only the terms and definitions that were specific. And where there were common terms and definitions, they would also display as well. Um, so it meant that we were always just working with one document, one single source of truth, but then that single source of truth could be uh, injected into different different parts. Um, so let's have a look at uh, let's have a look at some of the examples. So uh, this is an example of how we are make, able to use content reuse 
across the different platforms. This is a fairly straightforward glossary that you can see in our support portal. Um, and this is just the materialization of that uh, machine readable YAML document in HTML format. But as we're aware, not everybody just likes to read, uh, read through a, a, a glossary. Um, and as I mentioned before, what's more interesting is that um, users or readers can see a glossary uh, definition for a term right when they're reading a document. And so this is why we also implemented uh, a Hugo short code, which essentially allows us to um, uh, see uh, at the definition of a term um, when we mouse over that term in a kind of tooltip. And a Hugo short code is effectively just a small snippet of code um, that allows us to take a glossary term and uh, show the definition for that term as and when we want it. Um, as you can see below, uh, just with that uh, a short piece of code. And of course, um, uh, kudos to our, our front end development team who, who, who helped out a lot with, with this project as well. Uh, here's another example of uh, one of those glossary tooltips, uh, this time in our API documentation. Um, and what's interesting here was that in some cases, we had a set of terms that were only apl applicable to, to the API documentation. So we were able to take these again from the same, same glossary document and apply them to our, our, API, our API docs. And again, the aforementioned um, translation management tool, which in our case was Crowdin. Now, what was interesting in Crowdin's case is that, and this is the case for a lot of translation tools, they had their own glossary system, but we didn't want to be managing uh, a different glossary system in Crowdin. We wanted everything to come from our own uh, terminology repository in GitHub. So how were we able to do that? Well, Crowdin has an API, and we were able to connect with that API so that when we merge new terms and definitions um, to our, uh, our GitHub repo, they were automatically fed into the translation tool. And the glossary that sat in the translation tool um, or that sits in the translation tool um, is a read-only glossary. So translators can use, to, uh, use it to um, consult terms and definitions, but they can't um, alter anything there. And what was really interesting here was that um, uh, we had the whole docs as code process set up in such a way that um, when a new term was added to the glossary, it was done in parallel with that term or definition also being added to the software. So when it came for the translators to um, add uh, the translation of that term within the software itself, within the, the UI text or the strings, um, they were able to consult the definition of that potentially new term at the at the same time. So um, talking about uh, translations and internationalization of the glossary, currently uh, the glossary is only available in English, but we're also working on uh, making different language versions of the tool as well. And so the translation of this, um, uh, of the glossary itself would also be carried out in our case in our, uh, in our translation management system uh, via GitHub integration. And again, this is the same way as we have um, our string translation management set up. It's an automated process, um, whereas whenever we merge a new term and definition uh, uh, into main, into the main branch in, in GitHub, uh, the, the translator is then shown that translation. Um, and um, we found that this is a really interesting workflow um, and, and it's something we kind of coined uh, continuous translation as well. One thing that we're also keeping an eye on, um, and this is really at the time of uh, at the time of recording this talk, uh, 
is that Hugo itself is also adding um, native glossary support. Um, and so when that is uh, settled, we may well look at adopting that ourselves um, and it may well take out a lot of the, the custom work that we've done um, as, as far as development goes uh, on, on our side. And then on to governance and maintenance of this. Now, what's interesting um, is that, and something that I've really enjoyed about this project is that it's been a very collaborative experience. Uh, so the technical writing team has worked in conjunction with translators, with product management, um, and with the development team as well. Um, and as this project um, is, is ongoing, We've seen that um, it's been a really great way uh, to collaborate with uh, other members of the company. Uh, and it's really been nice because uh, technical writing teams quite often find themselves siloed into a specific place. Uh, and actually, you know, I even got to meet, uh, meet new people across the company as well in this project. So, um, that's it for me for now, um, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your uh, questions in, in the Q&A session. Thanks for listening. Welcome, everyone, to our Q&A session with Ian. We are so happy that you're joining us. We have a lot to get through, so let's just dive right into it. And first one's a kind of quick one, but to clarify, what is the difference between a term base and a glossary, just so we're all on the same page? Yeah, that's that that that's a, a really good question. I think um, s some people uh, kind of helped answer that as well in the chat. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, a term base is tends to be something that's kind of for for a start. It covers a lot more aspects than just a mere glossary. So a term base um, also has things like you know it's a, a machine readable document. Um, mm -hmm. it, it might you know also contemplate like things like translations um mm -hmm. and and whereas a glossary and i think you know something that i kind of touched on in, in the talk a glossary uh, individual glossaries can be kind of specific to in in our case just like one software platform in particular whereas the term base is specific to the whole kind of company um, and then what the glossary is doing is just kind of extracting like the bits that it wants to use in that um you know from that term base I love that. I had actually never heard that before. So I learned it, going to implement it, and it seemed really smart at work this week. That, so thank you. That, yeah, I mean, that, as I say, that's kind of my understanding. You know, please feel free to contradict me, people who know more about term bases. <laughs> all right, then let's go into, you mentioned during, so you like mentioned during your talk, bringing in all these different stakeholders, getting their opinions. People in the chat were talking about how many arguments tend to boil down between like a disagreement about a term, especially if it's been there forever. So how do you foster the internal adoption of like, particularly like contentious technical, like decisions, definitions, and when people have such strong opinions, like how are you kind of, how do you mediate that? What do you do? Yeah, great, great question. And um, yeah, uh, with with difficulty. Um, so so it's a it's a it's a really it's it's something that's that's hard to do. Um, Glossary, glossaries and, and, and terminology is hard. Um, I think one of the things again that I talked about um, uh, that we did that that was really interesting was this kind of adopting uh, sort of open source practices, mm -hmm. um, where we would kind of it's all very well kind of getting together. And we did have in person or virtual meetings as well, but it's nice to write things down. And of course, you know, we're technical writers, so you know, let's write things down. Um, do and, it. and it's nice to have like a kind of written record of you know how people have kind of come to this term and even uh, talking to stakeholders who have maybe been in, in the company in our case or in the organization for a long time and kind of getting their opinion is, is really helpful as well um, but i don't think there's kind of one easy way um to doing it um, you know as i say getting all the kind of relevant stakeholders together is is, is a sort of challenge in itself sometimes as well um, but certainly that kind of aspect where we would discuss and people would bring um you know I think I use the word evidence. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but people would bring sort of the reasons behind why 
this term is is mm-hmm. is, is, is is the one that we're going to use um and, and just kind of everyone would then sort of weigh up um the, these ideas but that, as i said right at the start you know terminology um is is quite a subjective thing um and uh yeah it's 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 not easy um but i think it's it's doable and and you know this is a project that we kicked off a while ago now and and of course it's ongoing um and and that's mm-hmm. something that's key as well you know this this is always ongoing and um there's always kind of room to sort of adjust things um obviously that then reflects on um your kind of your end users as well because if you have people who have been maybe using a product for a long time and suddenly you're changing a term that they're familiar with that's obviously another factor to to you know to to consider Oh, absolutely. I've been in the situation where like maybe the most technically correct term is not necessarily something that would make sense to the wider audience. So kind of having those discussions and being like, okay, where do we, where do we compromise here? Um, do you have any tips on like what to do once the term's decided to enforce that people use it? Well, like I said, I mean, that's one of the reasons for, for, for this whole project was to have this kind of single source of truth and say to people, hey, this is the single source of truth. You know, if you've got mm-hmm. a term, um, if you've got something that you want to change, then let's go through the processes, you know, of, of doing that. But uh, let's try and make ensure that, you know, we're using this um, this machine real readable document um, mm-hmm. that we put in place for for sort of everybody to use and everybody to draw from as as the kind of single source. Um, and and as I say, um, you know, we're not going to be able. To, we have a lot of. I talked a lot about Hugo as well um, and kind of mm-hmm. static site generators. And that's great because for everything that we sort of use as this kind of Hugo environment, and we have quite a few different sort of websites and things that use Hugo. But of course, we have other um, websites and, and other places where, where Hugo is not used. And of course, that's a little bit more difficult. That's something that we need to kind of work on, I think, still as to sort of how we um, how we kind of manage how we sort of manage terminology out with this sort of whole, uh, the, the kind of Hugo environment as well. But yeah. Yeah, of course. But I think like having a spec in something like YAML or if someone wanted to do a JSON schema, like it makes sense because then it is transferable between like different code bases or tools. Um, and then the next question we have is, do you have any way to automatically detect glossary terms and maybe add the tool tip or kind of link to the respective se- like section in a glossary page? And would you recommend that actually? So sorry, do, uh, ask me that again. So do I have a way of of, of recommending the tool tips? No, I, I sorry. So I, like, I didn't quite... do you have a way to automatically detect like in your documentation maybe like a term from the glossary and have it link back to it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. It's something that we're seeing now with the, with the translations um, mm-hmm. as a kind of where you put the glossary tooltips as a kind of general rule you know we follow things like um there's no kind of automatic checking in 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 that sense really um although i'll come to that with with the translation tools in a bit but um obviously if you're kind of following something like every page is page one and you're sort of putting like at the top of your documents that's where you have especially when you're introducing new terms that's where your kind of Mm -hmm. main um bulk of these sort of tooltip type things are going on um, obviously, that's going kind to of important. Not that's not to say that you can't use them throughout the documentation elsewhere. Um, and and that's a really interesting question. And now I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking, hey, we need to have some kind of best practices for this. But um, what happens, of course, in the translation tools is that when the translator sees these little tooltips, mm-hmm. they're sort of um, inside a, 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 a Hugo short code, mm-hmm. and so it sort of says to them, you know. Don't um, don't translate this, um, and and that's that's interesting because we've managed to kind of get things working so that um, the glossaries that well the first sort of edition of our internationalized glossaries which I've been working on since since the recording and, and now so that kind of first version um, with with these tooltips it's able to show the translated version mm-hmm. uh, in the translated content. Um, and so that kind of automation is, is really cool. As I say, that's literally something that we've been working on the last kind of couple of days. Um, but um, yeah, um, so there is kind of some automation there, but there's certainly other things we can do, I'm sure. Yeah, and then, I mean, relatedly, like, so 
the reason why, at least in our company, we've talked about not automatically linking to a glossary is because certain terms have different definitions depending on the context. So in this question, there was the example of like SQL as a, a you know, structured query language for programming or sales qualified lead could also be SQL. And basically like, does your YAML have like any support formatting or do you have any suggestions for different like terms or acronyms, but with varying definitions? Yeah, that that's another another really good question. I mean, currently we're not contemplating that so much, but I would say mm -hmm. um, we do have within the YAML things like acronyms. Um, we have you know fields for synonyms as well, which are not really exploiting at the moment. But it was something that mm -hmm. when we kind of started out the whole process, we thought this is going to be useful at some point, and we may well need to use yeah, it. So, in, in that case, um, yes there there is something there perhaps it's not um i would say it's not user facing right now oh. uh but but yeah it's a uh, it's it's a, an interesting point definitely but i think it's good to even if it's not necessarily user facing have it internally have that so then you can start the conversation and kind of move forward with everyone sure. who needs to be involved and then next question is about how do you like uh, defining the actual definitions so how much did you look at your competitors when you were defining your terms? Ooh, yeah, that's a, another interesting Spicy. question. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess that's important. Um, uh, but not like entirely, um, I don't know whether it's, it's something that sort of defines what you eventually end up using. Um, you know, because there's obviously going back to the kind of stakeholder meetings, um, there's obviously kind of a lot of uh, opinions going on there. Uh, and there's people who you've maybe worked in, say, in our case, you know, access control systems for, for years and years and, and are very, um, you know, familiar with the sort of terminology because there is a lot of kind of standard terminology around, around our sector, certainly as well. Um, but then you can also sort of say, you know, we're also, well, we're also a cutting edge company. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we can kind of come up with our own sort of new stuff as well. Um, and, and in that case, I think, um, uh, I, I, you know, we certainly look at what's going on in, 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 in the market as well. Um, uh, but I, I, again, um, that's almost kind of the difference as well there sometimes between sort of being market leaders where you don't always get things right, um, you know, but, but certainly, um, Certainly, yeah, uh, an interesting, interesting concept. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I work in IoT, so it's a lot of balancing, like what is kind of the industry standard for this term? Like what do people know for it versus how does it actually work in the product that I am currently documenting? And sometimes those can vary. So yeah, great question. Um, so the next one and our last one for the official part of this session is, do you try to prevent people from coming up with product names that are abbreviations that spell out words? So the example given was that people might like create a product called like the worldwide internet zero services because engineers really want to spell whiz. As an engineer, yes, we love acronyms. It is true. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. So like, I mean, well, obviously we have as well a kind of style guides and I think people have, who um, obviously, uh, uh, you know, in, in, within the kind of write the docs, community, people are aware of kind of style linters, things like Veil, et cetera. So we have a kind of style guide, which, you know, one of the big things in the style guide is always kind of spell out, spell out the acronym. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we, we try and avoid obviously um, using acronyms too much, but sometimes you'll get kind of pushed back. And I wouldn't say so much as well from just from, from I know the, the example was for developers, but also kind of from the sort of commercial side, um, particularly in, in a sector where, um, yeah, there, there are definitely quite a lot of acronyms used. Um, I'm always being a kind of technical writer, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I try and push back on, on using too many, on using too many acronyms. Yes. Um, but sometimes yeah. it's not always, uh, you know, that's not, that's not always easy. Uh, but at least, you know, this kind of spelling out the acronym. Uh, and then obviously with the kind of automated processes that we have as well. So you're capable, you're able to, to put an acronym within the body of, of some content. Um, and then of course the kind of short code will sort of help people figure out what that's supposed to mean. So yeah, um, 
I can't even remember what the original question was, but yeah, push back on acronyms. Um, push back, yes. fight <laughs> yeah. against acronyms. Fight, fight <laughs> against acronyms. But, but having said that, um, the thing with acronyms as well is that um, there are, of course, acronyms that people are all familiar with, but it's obviously kind of a case of sort of what's my audience, what, what is my audience familiar with? Are they familiar with these acronyms or not? And, and that's obviously something to kind of consider too. Yeah, of course. All right. And that is unfortunately the time limit for the official Q&A section. I know we had so many questions that we didn't get to really just everyone was really engaged. Thank you so much, Ian, for this talk.